Okay, people of uh, clearly, uh, they're clearly very happy to be back, to be back together in person again and enjoying chit chat and coffee and everything outside, but nonetheless, we'll push ahead. Our next session is entitled Urging the Shipping Industry to Progress to Decarbonization. Uh, we have two interviewees, uh, two interviewers and three interviewees. Let me introduce Jonathan Ward, partner at Stevenson Harwood, uh, who will introduce uh, the rest of the panel. Jonathan, please. Uh, good morning, everybody. So I'm Jonathan, one of the ship finance partners at Stevenson Harwood, and today I'm joined by one of my colleagues, uh, Harris. Um, he heads up the commodities team, and he's also been involved in various decarbonisation uh, projects, including as legal advisor to GMFC Cargo Charter and to um, the Aspen Institute's COZEV. Those two uh, projects are uh, interesting and relevant to themes that we're going to be covering uh, today, which is um, collaboration, peer pressure, and uh, customer pressure. So um, our panel, we're asked to address regulation, peer pressure, and industry unity are contributing to the push towards decarbonization. This is an industry perspective with a finest uh, focus. So on our panel today, we have uh, Lisa Dutoft, Chief Strategy and Analytics uh, Officer from Herg Autoliners, um, Michael Frisch, Member of the Executive Board, Danish Ship Finance, and we have Anthony Gurney, President and CEO of Ardmore Shipping. Um, each of you, do you want to say a few words about what you do, and then we'll kick off straight with the questions. Lisa. Yes, um, Her Autoliners, for those of you who do not know the company, is a global PCTC or Roro company. Uh, we operate a fleet of around 40 vessels uh, that can each take uh, roughly 6,500 cars or other large rolling stock that doesn't fit well into containers. Yes, and uh, Danish Ship Finance, uh, we're a specialized lender into uh, to ship finance. That's the only thing we do. We've been doing that since uh, 1961. Um, we have a portfolio uh, of loans of about $6 billion, uh, financing more than uh, 800 vessels. Uh, and we do that globally. And we do everything in-house from marine law to insurance to inspections and, of course, also uh, sustainability. Uh, Anthony Gurney, CEO of Ardmore Shipping. We own and operate a fleet of <clears throat> MR product and chemical tankers um, in worldwide trade, and we're also very focused on the energy transition. Very good, thank you. Um, Harris, would you like to ask the first question? Right, so um, the idea is that we will, set, we will put out the four themes rather than specific sort of questions for Q&A. And I'd like to start with the first theme for our panelists, and this is all about action now. So what does the industry need to do now in order to start on this process towards decarbonization? And the importance of now was probably best uh, 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 explained in last week when the new report from the IPCC came out that told us that we need to reach peak emissions by 25. So against that background, we know that maritime emissions have been going up by 5%, I believe, in 2021. So something needs to happen now, rather than just talking about 2050. And the four areas that perhaps uh, the panelists could, could say a few things about, one area is, of course, new builds. Lisa has a lot of experience, recent experience in that, because they have invested in, in new technologies with a new building pro program. The second area is retrofits whether it's wind propulsion or whether it's air lubrication, how does that fit in your, your strategy in the short term? Uh, of course, you have operational efficiency. And last but not least, carbon credits, offsets, insets. We don't need to be discussing whether it's zero or net zero, but it is very much part of the strategy for some companies, not for others. So those four topics you can mix and match or pick whichever is closer to your, to your experience. Lisa, starting with you. Thank you. Um, I can, of course, only speak for the uh, vessel owners and vessel operators in the PCTC industry. Um, but I believe that there is a lot that can be achieved with the existing fleet. Uh, with the Hu Auto Liners, we have managed to reduce our carbon emissions from 2008 to now by about 30%. 
And that has been achieved largely by changing vessel type, vessel design. Um, effectively, we've, we've changed our vessels from what you could call Ferraris, small vessels, large engines, to more of a people carrier model where we have you know, large vessels with fairly modest engines. But there's only so much you can do with your existing fleet, and we believe that we are starting to hit decreasing returns to scale and to really move the needle and to reach the net zero that we're all talking about, all committing to, we, we need fleet renewal, we need different vessels, we need vessels that can run on clean, zero carbon fuels. And that's what we're investing in, that's what we're building um, our new, we call it Aurora design around. It is the largest and greenest vessel uh, launched to date, or at least designed and ordered to date. Uh, it has received uh, ammonia-ready methanol notation from DNV. So when those fuels are available in a commercially viable manner, um, those vessels can, can generally reach a, a, a zero carbon profile. But those fuels are not available today. We all know that. So we've also tried to design the vessel so it can reduce emissions on existing fuels. So with LNG, and because of its larger size, it will reduce emissions per car transported by about 60%. And that is meaningful even on fossil fuels. And it's due to size. So this uh, vessel is, is about 30% larger than a standard industry vessel. And that gives not just a greener profile, but also much better economics. And that's also central to our strategy, our investment case, that not only is the vessel greener, it has much higher earnings capacity because of its bigger size. And that means that we can pursue a dual agenda of both decarbonization as well as commercial value creation because we're responsible both to the environment, but we also have shareholders and investors. So in our view, it is possible to push for these dual objectives. But as many panelists have said today, it requires all stakeholders to step up. We'd like to see access to competitively priced capital from the capital providers. As Michael Parker mentioned, we need stick and carrots from regulators to truly drive that through. Uh, but so far, we have uh, conviction in our ability to, to deliver vessels that can generally um, target net zero in the not too distant future. Thank you. Thank you. Lisa. Um, uh, Anthony, do you want to go next um, from your tanker perspective? <clears throat> yeah, I think it's counterintuitive if you're in the tanker business to uh, be excited about the future. Um, <laughs> but we are because we think, we, th we think of the energy transition as an opportunity. It's an opportunity to remain relevant. Um, it's an opportunity to do something that has meaning. Um, it's, it's also an opportunity to improve performance. So we, we're kind of embracing it. We've done that through a, uh, our, what we call our energy transition plan which involves three key things. Uh, first of all, focusing on technologies that can improve both fuel efficiency and future fuel opportunities. Uh, secondly is uh, cargo, uh, where we want to move away from uh, CPP or uh, fossil fuel type cargos more toward uh, non-CPP, chemicals, veg oils, biofuels, et cetera. And then the third area is working with our customers closely on projects that meet their energy transition needs. Probably going to be um, involving new building projects with uh, um, either um, you know, future fuel ready or uh, future fuel um, propulsion. So um, <clears throat> I think from a practical standpoint, uh, the question is what can we do now? Uh, and I, I, think, I think it's both frustrating, it's, it's, it's frustrating because the pace of change um, in terms of regulations is very slow and very uncertain. Um, but there are a lot of things that, that I think all companies can be doing today simply just to improve their fuel efficiency, which of course does improve performance. Um, and, you know, some of these things aren't, uh, aren't particularly complex, uh, but they do take a long time to install and get running. Um, so we can talk a long time about that, but that's, that's our approach. Um, I think there is, uh, you know, I, th I think we're all confused by the sense of urgency, but the natural timeline over, the, over which these things have to happen. And uh, it's not going to ha happen overnight, but there are things, there are a lot of things that we could all be doing today. And I think that uh, whether it's the Poseidon Principles or sea cargo charter, or pressure from customers um, and their customers. I think this is all, you know, positive and kind of pointing us in the right direction. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. Yep. 
Uh, Michael, you were telling me earlier that you spent quite a bit of your time uh, discussing ESG and decarbonization with the bank's customers. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. Uh, not, not only with the customers, but, but also with various kinds of, uh, of stakeholders, with investors, owners, employees for that matter. So um, ESG uh, is on, on top of the agenda at, uh, at all times in, the, in most meetings. Uh, and especially the climate-related uh, decarbonization is, is a big part of it. Uh, so I think also when, when we look at, for example, you asked whether as chip owners, how we do with retrofits or new bills, uh, we, uh, as a financing, uh, financing company, we need to look at the, at the full uh, client at the ship owner level and not only at the specific ship. Uh, so we, we recognize that this is a transition that will probably take many, many years, and we need to work together with the clients uh, in order to do so. So we'll need to do both. We'll need to finance both um, retrofits, um, if, if that is uh, what's needed for the existing fleet, and of course, we'll also look at new bills, even though it carries some kind of uh, extra risk for us as, as financiers um, uh, with the technology risk involved, but we have to be part of it. Um, as, uh, as I think uh, you have uh, already mentioned, everybody needs to, to chip in the, at this uh, to take out a bit of, of the risk in, involved in this transition. So as bankers, we need to do that uh, as well. So it's definitely a big part of what we do. Thank you. Michael, just sticking um, with the finance side now, because you're the representative of the banking community on our panel, um, just uh, extending on from what you're saying, what do you think ship lenders should be doing right now, and how, how, how should they um, uh, contribute to accelerating the decarbonization? Well, f first of all, I think perhaps especially so in, in the northern part of, uh, of Europe, um, but increasingly so in, in many parts of the world, we are facing, as, as finances, we're facing uh, more and more scrutiny from our stakeholders. We're seeing increased expectations that we have an active role in this decarbonization uh, process. Um, and how do we have an active role? It's mainly the indirect role we have with how do we deploy our capital, whom do we lend to, what kind of ships, what are the plans that these uh, ship owners have for also decarboniz uh, decarbonizing their uh, their fleet. So we work very actively with that. And with the, with the stick and the carrot, I mean, we, we have a, a variety of, uh, of products that can be used to do that. It could be sustainability linked loans where the margins reflect whether um, emissions are uh, above or below uh, f uh, trajectories. Um, uh, it could also be green loans, green bonds, and we need to work with that. And then I think also, uh, I think that, that we're doing, and I think more and more banks will do as well, is have uh, ESG ratings on uh, all the ship owners, uh, where we, of course, evaluate all the ESG parameters. Um, and here, especially the, the, the climate part is a big part of, of the E. Um, and without having a, over time, having a clear strategy on that area, it will be, I think, difficult for, uh, for ship owners to obtain finance. Uh, so I think it's, it, there will still be, as I said, it's a transition, it will take time, but I think that everybody needs to, to have a, a strategy and be transparent about uh, what you do. And from a bank's perspective, um, for the past, I don't know how many, 100 years, the, the credit rating, the credit evaluation has been the most important part. And now we have the ESG ratings uh, coming as well, and I think over time that will be equally important. Um, that uh, ESG ratings will be equally important as, as the credit ratings, and without a good ESG rating, it will be difficult to, to get capital. But there's still some time to go for everybody to, to learn how to, to, uh, to adapt to this. And your um, institution um, is more likely to finance um, uh, new buildings, but uh, is there still a market for financing uh, retrofits? There, there definitely, definitely is. Uh, we need to, to look at the whole fleet. We need to look at, uh, at it on a ship owner level. Uh, so we also need to finance retrofits. And we do that within the financing of the ship. So we take it as part of the ship. We cannot, uh, or typically do not do the financing of the retrofits in, in an isolated form. So we look at it as part of the ship and hopefully it also increases the value of the ship. So we, we take it as, uh, as part of that. Uh, that's also part of our responsibilities as, uh, as a bank. Can I ask the two, um, the two owners on the panel um, what they think the, the bank should be doing to accelerate the, or what they're seeing and what they should be doing? Will you start first, Lisa? Uh, yes, I think it's very much about um, giving priority to projects that do have a greener profile. What we see today 
is that the traditional lending ratios, uh, traditional covenants, are still far more important in our negotiations with finance providers than perhaps the emissions, the, the, the E ratio. And to truly, for all stakeholders, to push towards this uh, infamous net zero and preferably action now and not just by 2040 or 2050, um, it is that uh, recognition of uh, the, the lower emissions projects and, and looking for viable projects that can generally deliver competitive returns, which I think, for example, our new vessel design can because it has stronger economics and much lower emissions profile. And it's having focus on those type of investment projects that I think could accelerate this shift towards fleet renewal, which is ultimately what will be required to, to reach the lower net zero position. Anthony? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, so far the discounts or the, you know, the benefits of having a high score are fairly modest. So I, I think it'd be good if they were increased substantially. Michael. <laughs> <laughs> the penalties as well. <laughs> so. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I was interested in, in, in looking at ship finance is uh, how um, there are changes in, in terms of income assumptions and uh, stranded assets. Um, Michael, are you able to say a few words on, from the banker's perspective on, on income as assumptions and, and, and stranded assets? Of course, I mean, as bankers, we're, we're careful um, uh, people, uh, a bit conservative, so, so we, of course, focus on stranded assets or the risk of it. Um, but you have risk of uh, having stranded assets, whether you uh, use old technology, existing ships, uh, they could be uh, uh, over time obsolete due to new uh, technology, um, but a retrofit could prove not to be um, as uh, efficient or as, as uh, uh, yielding as, as, uh, as expected, and new technologies carries a lot of risk as well. So, so we still, I think we need to, to chip in uh, as banks and also take a little bit more risk. But I think it's, it's a lot about risk sharing, and I think for example, with the, with the green corridors, you can take away some of the risk because you can make perhaps longer term, more stable cash flows. I think that's important for us as, as banks uh, that we uh, that would not uh, carry, uh, carry all uh, the risk in, uh, in this uh, area. So, so stranded assets is a risk. It will always be a risk for us. And it's probably larger than it has ever been for, for the banking sector. But yes, that's part of it. So everything we can do to make risk mitigations would be welcome. Anthony, do you want to say a few words on... You, on stranded assets? Yes, and <coughs> what you're trying to do to avoid that? Well, you know, you know we typically... So in, in, the, in the oil tanker trade, when ships go beyond 15 years of age, it becomes more difficult to trade them. Of course, if the market's strong, then it, that doesn't matter so much. But, but generally speaking, I think for us uh, and others like us, I think, I think you know, keeping a relatively modern fleet is very important. Um, and uh, so if that, you know, so... Um, I think if, if you uh, let your let your average age of your fleet get too old, or, or allow some ships to uh, get a little too uh, long in the tooth, that could that could actually be be a real problem. And of course, then if you're up against uh, potential, um, you know, uh, being pretty close to or directly involved in the scrapping of the vessel, that adds a whole um, additional dimension of risk. So. Thank you, Elise. So uh, only that, that we believe that the residual value risk on smaller, older vessels in our industry have gone up significantly. They're doing very well in today's market where rates are high and supply is short. But if and when that dynamic changes, um, I suspect those, those residual values will may come under pressure, in particular if in parallel with a technology shift where newer and greener fuels do become more available. So I would look out for that. Right, so um, a few concluding words on the last topic. Uh, just to pick up on an earlier theme about sticks and carrots and the fact that the shipping industry is no longer an island isolated and only affected by the law of the flag. It's more visible. There's pressure, shareholder pressure, stakeholder pressure. The industry accepts it's part of the supply chain. The need to collaborate all those things that we hear a lot about. How do you see these things in real life? 
in practice. So, for example, on the tanker side, do you see the development of something that will look like green tanker pools, which we don't obviously have yet? Or do you see uh, some sort of multilateral collaborative structure that will develop and assist decarbonization? Because from our side as, as lawyers, what we do see quite a lot is very limited, and this is all the uh, tweaking charter party clauses around spin the performance, around warranties, around risk sharing for retrofits. We see quite a bit of that, but it's still very small. So where is all that big collaboration that is, is going to, to drive the change? That's one theme. And another theme is how much do you feel that you're affected by that peer pressure or stakeholder pressure or shareholder pressure or supply chain pressure in real life? Lisa, starting with you. I think um, customers are the strongest force for change. And if customers push for greener transport, for greener shipping, the industry will deliver that. Um, so we are working with our customers, which are often large car manufacturers, um, to discuss how we can help them in their decarbonization journey, reaching their goals. And we believe that over time, um, those car manufacturers that are selling new energy vehicles, that are selling electric vehicles, ultimately also want those vehicles to be transported on, on greener vessels. And, and I think that's where you get the collaboration over time. It, it, the customers are a very powerful force. So we have to work with them and convince them that we can assist in lowering their emissions profile. But of course, your customers are consumer facing. Yes. Which may not be the case with the tanker or the dry bulk customer. Anthony, what do you think? Yeah, I think, I think it's true. I think you have to also understand that, you know, the situation that or position that oil majors and oil traders are in, uh, which is that they, you know, they're in a very, very competitive business. Um, and okay, every business is competitive, but I think if you're in the, in the car business or containers, you're much closer to the, uh, to the end user and you'll feel that pressure more directly. Um, so that's, that's definitely the case. I think that like Lisa and, and their business, they would be feeling that more directly. We would welcome it. Um, and and it, it is there, but it's it's kind of hard in the construct of our you know of our, our trade to uh, kind of you know build that into the to the discussion yet. Um, but in terms of collaboration, I think you know not just among tanker companies, but all shipping companies should be exchanging information. And I think it's great that banks are putting pressure. And I think the question you know on on, on companies, I think the question that's been posed here is, what are you doing today? And that should be a question that would be good good to ask all shipping companies. You know, they should be hearing that from all their stakeholders. You know, what are you doing today? Because a lot of what you can be doing today is actually really good for the business as well. Um, so, yeah. Thank you. Michael, anything about be collaboration beyond the Poseidon principles, of course? Or? Yeah, I, th I actually think there's a lot of collaboration uh, going on uh, right now. As I said, I, I think... I mean, it's it's a, it's a, we everybody has to, uh, to uh, as I said everybody has to chip in in order to make this happen. This decarbonisation uh, that goes for banks as well. So we're having very uh, intense dialogues with our clients on how are they going about this and how can we facilitate that? How can we finance that? So I think there's a lot of uh, collaboration, and it's it is expected from. Uh, I mean, we uh, we get financing our own by institutional investors. It's expected that we do something uh, about this. And I think for, for us as, as financing uh, parts, we, we need, in order to be relevant also in a decarbonized future, we need to be on top of this, a little bit on the forefront and working with the clients, not against the clients or penalizing them, or, but working with the clients in order to make this uh, decarbonization to, to work. Uh, and then I, I think personally that we need to, to see a little bit more pace from the regulators uh, in order to, to make this happen. There's a little bit of catch up uh, to, to do. Um, but I think the, the collaboration uh, is, is already there to, to, uh, to last degree. It could be a lot better, but it's, it's there, I would say. Thank you. Are we out of time? Yeah, okay. Um, thank you very much, panel, for contributing so uh, uh, enthusiastically. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.